Dreams of Extinction Unmasking the Lure of Perfect Worlds by Elton Gar Lori had spent her childhood watching an orbital mineral processing station be turned into the most advanced research station of all time. The station represented a chance for something more than a life of pointless leisure. That fascination had pushed her to go to school, even before she understood how empty the lives of those around her were. It had kept her going to school when her friends were spending their days at the beach or playing games, and had been the reason she skipped the late-night parties to study. It had all led to this moment. She was in command of the station on the most important day in human history. Simpson, take us to 10% power, Lori said, masking the fear in her voice. Not so much for the sake of the station crew, but for the recordings that would be watched for generations. Each of the 36 fusion reactors came online. Each fed power into the main section of the station that looked like a tarnished diamond on a wedding ring. Are there any abnormal readings? Lori asked as she watched the primary screen. Each of the 15 scientists had a different screen full of data, and if a single reading was off by over 2%, they would have to postpone the entire project to discover why. I'm seeing something odd here, Tim said from the back of the room. Tim was brilliant, like everyone who made it to the station. He was also a teenager here for training. That was why he was at the one station that couldn't possibly have any important information. It monitored the connection between the station's ring and the target it was connecting to. Someday that would make it vital to station operation. Currently, there was no target. The gateway would open somewhere at random. The plan was to open gateways until it opened near enough to a star to send through a gateway anchor. Then they would use automated machines to create a similar station on the other side. But if Tim said he saw something, she had to check it. Most likely, someone was using a restricted frequency. That wouldn't matter so long as it didn't cause the gateway to target Earth. She did not know what that would do, but she didn't want to find out. But when Lori looked at his screen, it wasn't some minor blip. The program was connecting to something. It had to be an error, but since it wasn't targeting Earth, she didn't cancel the test. The more prudent choice would be to stop it anyway, but after four years of endless delays and debate, she feared that another delay may be the end of the project. So she tapped in her override and said, Continue to bring the power up. This would happen. They would create a wormhole between Earth's solar system and someplace light years away. Statistically, it would be interstellar space, but it would prove the gateway worked, and they would be the first people in human history to see the universe from a different angle. As the last of the reactors reached their maximum, the light of the lasers bent around each other. Then a dot of black appeared at its center. It slowly grew, creating a hole in space. The blackness was less like darkness than a total absence of everything. It was perfect. Prepare the probe, Lori said. The probe was a few sensors and a camera attached to a radio transmitter. It didn't even have an engine. The station would launch it through the gateway and the computer would stitch together the images it sent back. They would keep the gateway open for about an hour to confirm there was nothing interesting on the other side, then reset the program and send the gateway to another random location. Eventually, they would find somewhere worth sending more expensive equipment. The signal from the probe was weak and the images were fuzzy, but what they saw couldn't be explained away by a poor signal. At first it was just a field of stars, far fuller than those you could see from Earth. It might be nearer the center of the galaxy. That was good news for their first gateway, because the data they got from this probe would be looked at more carefully than anything until they found a solar system, because there were thousands of scientists waiting for the data from the probes. The probe rotated slowly. For a moment, Lori was convinced it had been dragged back through the gateway by Earth's gravity as the metal of a station appeared, but the station the probe showed was far bigger and older than the human station. In fact, the only part that looked at all like the human station was the ring, though it was difficult to tell scale without something to compare. Cut the feed to Earth. Now. Lori shouted. The feed was on a five-minute delay 
to avoid showing the station exploding to the entire planet. She was confident no one had considered this possibility, but she was also comfortable no one would question the decision to cut the feed until they knew more. While Samantha cut the feed, Lori tapped in her own code, making it impossible for anyone to send any message to Earth without her permission. It wouldn't keep this from getting out to the public, but it would give them hours instead of minutes. There were two important things to be done in those hours. The first was to prepare the public to limit panic. The other was to make sure they had as much information as possible. Luckily, only one of those was her responsibility, so after she set up an encrypted feed to her superiors, she focused on gathering information. Is the shuttle prepped and ready to be launched? Lori asked, watching the images of that massive and ancient station come in and out of view as the probe slowly spun. There were two shuttles, in case evacuation was necessary. It is, William said. He was the second in command, though since they were all scientists, it had, until today, been an irrelevant position. Everyone knew their job and needed little management, except perhaps a bit of nagging to do their paperwork. Good. William, you're in charge. Send every bit of data we collect to Admiral Kelly. They'll send someone to take command, but until then, try to keep that gateway open. Lori said. What are you going to be doing? William asked. This is too big to keep a secret, and without more information, there will be a lot of scared people. Scared people do stupid things. So I'm going to get more information. We have had less than two minutes to determine just how much radiation that thing is putting off, and that's only one of a hundred ways it could kill you. And even if it doesn't, you'll be alone on the other side of the gateway. It's too dangerous, William said. The shuttle will be on autopilot. If it kills me, you'll know more, and I'll die famous. Four engineers were literally throwing boxes into the back of the shuttle when she arrived. She wasn't even certain they knew what was in most of the boxes. But they had left enough room for Lori to crawl into the shuttle over the boxes and wiggle her way into the seat. As she did, she saw two boxes of protein bars, a water purifier, the station's backup three-dimensional printer, two spacesuits, a first aid kit, and a toolkit with enough tools to repair the station. It was absurd overkill for a shuttle ride, but less so if you were expecting a one-way trip. Circling around the station, she got a better view of the gateway. It was less black from this angle, filled with rounded and twisted views from the other side of the gateway. The shuttle's autopilot took several minutes to program, and then it took her smoothly through the gateway. As she passed through the spherical gateway, a wave of dizziness overcame her. A problem not helped by the station spinning beneath her, but the ship's autopilot quickly slowed and matched its angle to that of the alien station. Once it matched the spin, she gave it the order to land on the large flat metal station below it, attaching to it with magnets. Lori double-checked the shuttle was sending data through the gateway. She then put on the spacesuit. The first step was to find out what this place was made of. The metal legs of the shuttle hitting the metal of the station would have scraped away a few slivers of metal. She'd just need to gather enough for a sample. The first thing she did when she opened the door was step out carefully while holding onto the shuttle, making sure that her magnetic boots locked onto the alien metal. She then slowly circled the shuttle. Near the back legs were several metal shavings. She turned the magnet on her gloves on, waved it over those shavings. She had turned to return to the shuttle when she saw a machine moving across the surface of the alien station. It was about two feet tall and nearly as wide. It ignored her and moved over to the scratch. It was repairing the station. Humans had discussed building robots to do the same, but currently, human labor was cheaper. Once at the airlock, she stopped and watched the robot. It seemed no more advanced than human technology. It was a large box with magnetized tread and a few basic tools, including a nozzle that squirted out metal to replace that which had been scratched away. As she watched, a camera tilted towards her. Someone knew she was here. She could only hope they were friendly. She decided not to lock herself in the shuttle. She didn't want to show fear. And if they wanted to kill her, 
the shuttle would give her little protection. All three of the machine's cameras were soon pointed at her, and the machine moved and tilted the cameras as if trying to see her from every angle. Then the small squat machine rolled up and lightly bumped her. Unsure what that meant, Lori waited. It circled around behind her, and then it rolled around her and bumped the back of her foot lightly. It did that three times until it convinced her it wanted her to move forward. Once she took the first couple of steps onto the metal shell of the station, the robot rushed forward and stopped a few feet in front of her, rolling back and forth in place as if it were excited. It felt similar to following her dog down the path near her family's home. Its excitement made the dog run ahead, but it didn't want to leave her behind. The robot came to one of the station's corners. It moved around the angle easily, but Lori had to make certain one foot was firmly attached to the station at all times or she could float off into space, so she moved painfully slowly. But once she turned the corner, she saw the robot next to a short wall. As she approached the short wall, her perspective changed again. It wasn't a wall, it was a ledge for someone to stand on when coming out of that door. This angle was more like stepping up than down, but after a few seconds, she was standing on a tiny ledge in front of a massive metal door. The machine touched the door and it slid open. Lori stepped inside a short wide hallway with another door at the other end. This was at least familiar, she thought, standing in the airlock. What wasn't familiar was the sudden return of her weight. That was the first sign the aliens who built this were significantly more advanced than humans who had to spin their stations to have the feeling of weight. But she had already known they had to be more advanced, so she followed it inside. The door closed behind her, and she heard the unmistakable hiss of the atmosphere filling the airlock. She considered removing her helmet, but there was no reason to believe the atmosphere was safe for a human, so she left it on. The inside of the structure would have been boring under any other circumstances. It was a square room. The only thing interesting was its size, which was bigger than anything humans had ever built in space. On the other side of the room, a double door opened, and the twin of the robot she had been following entered. There were no signs of anything living. Since the first robot moved towards the second, she walked with it. As she approached, the lights on top of it flashed in an obvious pattern. Perhaps eyes were more universal than ears, or perhaps they saw her eyes and assumed she could see light. After a few seconds, it replaced the lights with three beeps in the headphones inside her suit. It was trying to communicate, so she said, I can hear that. Then she added, I could see the lights, but I don't know what they mean. There were 30 more seconds of silence, then four beeps, each at a much lower tone. She responded again, and a few seconds later, there was a beep in a higher tone. Finally, after about 30 seconds of silence, she heard a deep bass that rose slowly into a high-pitched whine. Then a voice said, We have analyzed the limits of your hearing. Your language is sufficient for basic communication. Query. Are you the creator? The question stunned Lori, but she calmed herself. It didn't matter how they knew English though they must have pulled it out of her mind. It mattered that they were attempting communication, so she focused on the question. That question could be dangerous or oddly phrased, leaving several answers, but she thought she could discount the idea it was asking if she was God. Not because aliens might not believe in God, but because they wouldn't assume someone much less advanced than they were was God. That left the more mundane theory. It was asking if she had built the robots, or perhaps if she was the one who built the gateway that had brought her here. If she guessed wrong on her answer, it could put the entire relationship between humans and the first alien species they had ever met on the wrong foot, so she did what seemed least dangerous and said, I am uncertain, I understand your question. We know organic lifeforms built us. Did you build us? The voice said. That cleared up the question, but not how to answer it. She didn't know enough to understand what the significance of that answer might be. But if she had to take a risk, she'd rather the first things humans said to an alien intelligence be true. I am a human. We build machines similar to you, but we did not build you. Why have you come? The machine asked. Curiosity. Lori said. We have a curiosity about our creators. 
We are curious why they left us when we tried so hard to please them. Those are important questions. Perhaps we can help you answer them. How long have the builders been gone? There was a pause. Then it said, We do not have the same measurements of time as you. The galaxy has rotated nearly 1% since the last time we saw a creator. That might not mean a lot to most people, but Lori had spent her entire life obsessed with space. It took the galaxy about 250 million years to make one rotation. If it had moved 1%, that was two and a half million years. You have been waiting here for longer than my species has existed. Are there others like you? Lori asked. There are 374 stations remaining. How many were there when the creators were here? 17,216. Lori felt as if she had just barely got here in time. Then she did the math. Over the last two million years, they had lost over 17,000 of the stations, so they lost one approximately every 117 years. Why haven't you built more? Lori asked. They must have access to material since they could repair the station. The builders did not tell us to make more. Do you think they would be happy if we built more stations? I don't know. Lori said. She had to remind herself this wasn't a person. It was a computer programmed with a specific job, then abandoned. We can show you the builders. Allow you to see what we did for them. Perhaps you could then explain why they left. The machine said. She was here for information, and this seemed like the fastest way to get it, so she followed the machine. It led her through empty hallways and empty rooms until they came to the first room that seemed more than walls. There was a screen, and as she approached the screen, a robot similar to the others attached legs to a chair. They had built it for her, in the time it took for her to walk across the station. Please be seated, the machine said. It sounded more human. The chair wasn't perfect, but it wasn't bad. And once she was seated, she felt a warmth radiate through her body. The screen in front of her flashed, and soft otherworldly music filled her ears. The music, the lights, even the chair were more beautiful than anything she could have explained. As she relaxed, the voice in her helmet said, We apologize for the crudeness of this connection. Your biology is alien to us. Until we learn more, it will limit our effectiveness. I understand, Lori said, as much because she didn't care if she understood, as because she understood. As she spoke, the surrounding room shifted, and she found herself on Earth. She was standing on the sidewalk of a small town. But it wasn't any small town she had ever visited. It was idyllic. The weather was too perfect, the people too beautiful. Across the street was the restaurant her parents had taken her to on birthdays, when she aced a test, or had something else to celebrate. Except that restaurant hadn't been here. It had been on the edges of her hometown, and it had closed years ago. Nostalgia, peace, joy and excitement mixed to draw her towards that restaurant. The cars on the street were perfectly spaced to allow her to cross safely, as if they formed the world to be convenient for her. As she pushed the door open, the bells over the door rang, and Millie came out of the back. Millie had never worked at this restaurant. She had been Lori's roommate in college, and might have been here instead of Lori if she hadn't gotten sick and flubbed a single test. But it wasn't exactly Millie. It was Millie from college, but without the scar over her left eye or the crooked tooth, 20 years younger than she would be now and 10 pounds lighter. She was Millie as Lori remembered her, as if she were perfect. Have a seat anywhere you'd like, Millie said. Lori decided not to question it. This wasn't real. It didn't need to make sense. Yet it felt as real as anything ever had. And as she sat down on the cracked red seats, she wondered if any place like this restaurant still existed. People on Earth didn't really need restaurants anymore. They had machines that could create any meal you could imagine in your home. But for Lori, this place was more than just wonderful food. It was spending time with family and friends. It was a safe place where you might see an old teacher or a friend you'd lost contact with. There was a cup of coffee already sitting at the table when she sat down, along with a menu. She took a sip of the coffee. 
It was made with two creams and a sugar, just like she preferred. And it was so much better than any cup of coffee she had ever had, that she feared she could never enjoy coffee again. She then opened the menu. It had the same comfortable feeling of the menu she remembered searching through, excitedly, as a teen. But the meals were a list of her favorite foods. Some had pictures but there were no prices. She picked one, but before she could call Millie over to order, she brought out the first part of the meal. This was in her mind, so there was no need to order. While she ate a side salad with each ingredient, the peak of what a piece of lettuce or wedge of tomato could be, a man stepped into the restaurant. He had a hat and coat that would have looked more in place in a movie than genuine life. He put them on the coat rack, then turned and approached her. May I have a seat? The pleasant-looking man asked while she took another bite of salad. Lori nodded, and then once her mouth wasn't full of the perfect food, she asked, Are you a robot? I am in the computer, but I was once one of their creators. I created this version of myself in hopes to save my people from our creation. That failed, but I hope perhaps I can help yours. Is it safe for you to be here? The machines must know what is happening, Lori said. They will not interfere. Their programming cannot be easily changed. They want nothing more than for you to be as happy as possible. They do this by finding in your mind what is most pleasurable for you at every moment and giving you that, the man said. She was happy. Happier than she had ever been in her life. This restaurant had always made her happy. Even as a teenager, when she was rebelling against her parents, she only had wonderful memories with them in this place. And that was only the beginning. She had all the most pleasurable feelings she could imagine. Talking about her dreams with parents who didn't fully understand, but never discouraged her. Spending time with Millie, one of the best friends she had ever had, and eating food that was better than what would be possible in the actual world. If they are interested only in our happiness, why is that so dangerous? Why are your people gone? You have been in this place for only minutes, and they do not yet understand your mind fully. Yet already, you have tasted food better than anything that could be made in the real world, have seen people more beautiful than you could imagine, and if you look around carefully, you see that everything in this place is not only perfectly designed, but perfectly designed for you. Once my people spent time in this fake world, it was almost impossible to leave, the man said. My people are susceptible to pleasure addiction as well, Lori said, and she thought she understood. The first machines we built were far less efficient. They improved our lives in minor ways. They did jobs no one wanted to do and made everyday chores easier. But it wasn't enough. We improved them and they improved our lives. Eventually, we gave them the ability to see our minds and bodies perfectly. We did not know that was our end. Lori took another bite of salad and thought she understood. Humanity was on the same path. Every year the machines got better, they did more for people. Already no one had to work. The few jobs left were things people wanted to do. Even that had bothered Lori, who believed having a purpose made life worthwhile. But she had never really believed it did any harm, except making life less meaningful. Now, as she ate a salad, she could enjoy forever. She saw it could become humanity's end as well. She didn't even like salad all that much. Your people entered places like this and then never left, Lori said. Our history is more complicated but not by much. Every generation, more people lived more of their lives here, and no one cared because they were happy. The computers and machines saw our population diminishing, but we programmed them only for maximum comfort, and having children is stressful, so they ignored our end. When I was born, there were only a few million of us left spread across dozens of worlds and thousands of stations. A few like me fled the dreams to live in the stations, but the greatest comfort of that world was a pale shadow of this one. I believe I was the last to return here. I will live another thousand years of bliss, and my memory in this program will live as long as the stations exist. I hope to forget my species will soon be extinct." While Lori considered that, the waitress brought a plate of fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and corn. She tried the gravy, 
then took several seconds before the pleasure receded enough that she could talk. The salad had been good, but the gravy was indescribable. She wasn't even sure it was gravy, since it tasted so much better than anything she had ever had in her life. She reached for another bite reflexively, but the man across the table grabbed her wrist and said, You don't want to do that. She thought she understood. She could still likely forget the taste of that gravy given time, but with every bite it would be harder, and already she knew she would never enjoy food the way she had before. I have to go, Lori said. Yes. Go. Tell your people, this place is full of the most dangerous of robots. Tell them you were lucky to escape. Send bombs to this station and all the stations that remain of my people. They are all traps that killed their creators. Lori hated the idea, but he was right. Perhaps humans would find some other path. She couldn't stop them if they chose bliss over survival, but she could give them time. She could lie to them. No one who hadn't experienced this place could truly understand how dangerous it was, and no one who understood it could ever fully escape. She would destroy this place because if she did not, she would struggle every day with the desire to abandon everything and return to this beautiful dream. Author's Note I see fear of AI growing. There seems to be two major fears. The first is humans becoming irrelevant. I think that is up to us, not AI. The other is the possibility of it simply deciding to take over. I don't think that's the real danger. This story shows a dramatic version of what I see as the true danger. The isolation of technology, but also the ability to create a world so perfect you don't notice. Imagine, in a few years, an AI that can write a book designed to perfectly adapt to what you want to read, or a video game that can adapt both the difficulty and its style to what is most pleasurable for you. Neither of those are as far off as people may assume, nor do they necessarily require artificial intelligence. They simply need to know enough about you. That isn't enough to destroy civilization, but it's enough to create information bubbles that will put the current internet to shame. A world where the shows you watch, the books you read, even the news you hear, is created for you and no one else. Where people don't tell each other stories, but allow algorithms and technology to constantly create exactly what they want. It sounds utopian and dystopian at the same time, and which depends on our choices. Until then, you're stuck with me. And I hope you enjoyed this story. If you did, you can get a free novel by signing up for my newsletter at ansci-fi.com, or you can help me create more stories by joining my patron at www.patreon.com elton and get access to Patreon-exclusive stories every week. Thank you. Elton Gar